so much. Well, first of all, I'd like to start out just by thanking you, James, for making the trip across the pond. It was a little longer commute than we all had tonight, but uh, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, now, you've had a very long, successful career. You've played some really memorable roles in sort of cultural phenomena like Downton Abbey and Game of Thrones, but St. Paul is a little different. <laughs> and uh, beyond his obvious religious significance, he is a sort of a seminal, foundational figure of Western civilization. Uh, so given that historical and spiritual import, was there any hesitancy on your part for uh, when you were first approached by the role? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all, you were up for the challenge. Yeah. I grasped the, the significance of the film the moment I read the script. Uh, a wonderful script and a, and a wonderful role for an actor to play. My only hesitancy really was in the size of the beard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we actually, earlier this year, or actually last year, we had Mel Gibson here, and he was sporting quite a oh, beard. Oh, that's... But I think no, you outdid him with his well, beard, actually. Well, I don't so know. Think in the beard meter, you won. <laughs> it's arguable. <laughs> um, a common comment of actors that I've had the pleasure of interviewing often say that when they're preparing for a role, even if it's a role that they don't necessarily share anything in common with the character, they often try to find some sort of an emotional connection. Can you talk a little bit about the process and what was the connection that you were able to find with Paul? I had very little time to prepare for the role, uh, just a matter of days. So initially, my uh, concerns were that of learning the words and not having really enough time to research the life of Paul. I knew something of the life of Paul from an early age because I, I was lucky to uh, have been sent to uh, Sunday school and, and to be uh, in a boarding school for 10 years of my life and therefore go to chapel twice a day, every day. So the story was known to me, but what, was, what I didn't know about Paul was really the subject matter of the film, which is the last few days of his life. And I, I was really unaware of of what his sufferings were and might have been in prison. But in Andrew's script, because, he, uh, because Paul is confronted in his solitude with those that he's persecuted, that requires no research to understand what that is and what he did to people and what is done to people. And I think that's one of the most important aspects of the film. The and all around us, people are still persecuted for their faith. It's happening now. Mm -hmm. It's happened increasingly in the last few years. And that is incredibly moving. And if the film conveys anything, it is that love of a fellow man is the most important thing in this world. And even those who are not able to advance love, even they, even they deserve redemption in the end. The, the character of Paul is also very different from some of the other roles that you've played, um, particularly given the point he is in his life. Uh, the, some of your other characters are, uh, be hard to call necessarily sinister, but maybe they don't have the moral compass that Paul has later in life. I don't think there's anything sinister about Uncle Jeffrey in Bridget Jones's diary. <laughs> But I will admit it is a novel idea to cast possibly the world's most famous bottom pincher as <laughs> St. <Saint> Paul. <laughs> but there is grace enough for him. <laughs> um, Andrew, when you were here last, I guess it was 2016 with Full of Grace, which focused on the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Peter, um, were you already did you already know you wanted to tackle St. Paul next? That's a very good question. Um, I think that we had percolated some ideas once we saw um, the response to Pull of Grace. Um, we got excited about telling another story, and I think that Paul just felt like the right 
the right person's story to tell. We love doing Full of Grace because nobody had ever focused on the end of Mary's life, you know, a lot of nativity story, a lot of that sort of thing, but um, nothing at the end. And this one just stuck out as we, we were kind of shocked that nobody had tackled it, that, that there was no theatrical film on Paul, who is arguably the most significant Christian figure outside of Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's interesting. I think I was doing some research, and I think for, except for some very hard to find films back from, I think, 38 and 49, uh, there isn't any big screen treatment of Paul. There's been some somewhat terrible made-for-TV movies, but uh, so why do you think that is? I mean, when you do Bible films, they're generally either about the life of Christ, mm -hmm. and then there's a lot of rich pruning of the Old Testament, but that early church period, yep. uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot. I mean, you go back to, uh, you know, uh, Quo Vadis and, and The Robe with Richard Burton, but other than those two, why do you think that that period is not as much examined as other periods? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I wonder if people have run into the same thing that we ran into at the beginning, which is, you know, Paul's life is this massive, um, you know, 30-year journey. And when you look at it A to Z, I think it's, it's pretty impossible to try to fit into a film, um, which is why we sort of dug into, you know, this particular time period. And, um, but I'd say that that might be why it's a very hard story to crack, very hard to figure out um, which angle to tell that doesn't just become an, an expository A to Z, let me just show you here, 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 here. Um, so it could be that. Yeah, I mean, I think what you did so wisely, uh, it's similar to what uh, Steven Spielberg did with his film on Lincoln. You have this other towering figure and rather trying to do, almost do like a Wikipedia type movie, right. this happened right. and this happened and this happened, you really condense it to a short period of time, but in doing so you really reveal a lot of the character. And both films share a similar type of approach. They're both backward-looking films. Uh, Full of Grace deals with the last days of Mary's earthly life. Um, and here, as James said, it's really the later Paul, almost the, the Paul haunted by his past. Uh, was that intentional? Are you, are you sort of fascinated by that idea of looking back over a life? Well, hearing that, now I make sure the third one I do doesn't do that. So <laughs> I'll make, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, yeah, there's something fascinating to me about being able to um, dig into somebody's, um, you know, I think who we are at the end of our life is, is, is such a wonderful summary of, of, of just uh, the humanity. And, and I wanted to, I think it's the best way to look at somebody's memories. And, and really an insightful way to see who they've become uh, at the very end. And I hope we can all go out like Paul at the end and with that kind of grace and, and wisdom. And um, so there's something fascinating. I think Mary as well in Full of Grace was the same idea that it's interesting to see what the sum of their life kind of leads them to and, and explore that. Sure. Um, Eric, Full of Grace was a much smaller film um, and there was a very distinct Catholicity about it. I mean, uh, the Mariology of it, the so called Eucharistic themes, and you know, obviously, this film as a, a film with a major studio behind it. Obviously, they want to maximize the you know as, as large a, a faith audience as possible. So you've shown this to many different audiences: Catholic audiences, non-Catholic audiences, audiences of other denominations. What's the response been across the board so far? Yeah, it's been it's been a, uh, an amazing response. So. So as an organization, we're, we're a Catholic organization, and we've had the privilege of working with Carmel Communications and partnering to market to the Catholic world. So we've got another, another partner that's working uh, in the evangelical side, a company called Collide, who did a lot of the promo uh, stuff for the Veggie Tales and other things. So I, I don't know um, tremendously, I haven't heard a lot of feedback from, from, from their side of things. But I know in the, in, the, in the experiences that we've had and firsthand, and it's just such a treat to be at this place where, you know, you've, you, we've been through this long journey and now we're getting the chance to show people and to see their responses and to talk to people and to see um, just what seems to be a real consistent uh, movement of their heart toward the humanity that um, Andrew so eloquently wrote into the story and, and James and, and the others so beautifully portrayed seems to be something that is really striking a chord, that these are, that we're, we're telling a story um, about people who often we put on a pedestal and we think that we can't quite attain or reach the, the level that they're at, but, 
but that in, throw, in, in communicating the story in the way that we are, that people can see that they're just like we are, you know, that they're just like they struggle, they have pains and doubts and burdens. And I think that's, uh, I see a lot of connection to that in, in the story. Um, so we've had a chance to uh, do a lot of, of, of screenings over the last six weeks or so. We did have a great um, opportunity early on to screen on the Sony lot with um, evangelical pastors. And uh, a firm uh, had picked out about 20 uh, key Southern Baptist ministers who lead big churches around the country to watch the film. And it was cool to be there and to hear them and their consistent response uh, was um, how much they appreciated um, the story was f very imbued with scripture. Um, and yet you weren't being read the scriptures at you, you know. And I, I think that's been something that's been really cool to see um, the response to that too. And, and, and the telling of the story and having it be um, just one that's very real, very human. That's great. Three, three Catholic boys in front of Baptist ministers. We were uh, nervous on the scriptural <laughs> side of things, and we, we made it somehow. Speaking of three boys, now, um, ODB, you have been together for some time. Can you tell a little bit how you three together sort of formed this company and, and got into the ministry of filmmaking? Yeah. Oh man, it takes a memoir to tell the story and someday maybe we will, but just, so ODB's been around since 2005 and the first 10 years, um, we've made over 200 short films for Catholic teens and that's really been our focus. But the, you know, the Lord, I mean, I laugh when I, I wake up and I, I laugh and I think about the journey that we've been on and, and how he brought TJ into my life and into the ministry's life and how TJ connected Andrew into that life. And really, um, we met April of 2013. So it's been a five year journey and just started to explore um, we had asked, we'd been asked questions uh, from, from people who had used our films over the years, do you have any films on Lives of the Saints? And it finally got to a place where, because we had been asked the question a lot, and so we just kind of explored um, what would those stories look like, you know, and how would we want to produce those stories? And that's when I connected with these guys, and, and we produced Full of Grace. Even on day one of shooting Full of Grace, we didn't even think, we had no concept that we were producing a feature film. Um, but the Lord had other things in store for that. And then, and then that led to the opportunity to, you know, for a little company like Sony to come <laughs> alongside of this major not-for-profit like ODB Films. <laughs> well, when the three of you are on the road, do either of them have better singing voices than Luke apparently did? So. Anybody has Any <laughs> um, well, It's been a great journey. That's great. And, you know, I thank James for making the travel. I also have to thank you because I understand... Your daughter's birthday is tomorrow, so happy birthday to your daughter. And thank you. Thank Her birthday you for... is today. Oh, it's today. Yeah. It's today. Okay. Yeah, well, happy birthday. I missing those birthdays. Thank you. That's great. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Um, TJ, now, while they're off having fun filming, you and Eric have to do the hard job of producing. And when you were here last, you know, Full of Grace was, again, a smaller film. Now, working on a bigger film, um, what was that experience like and what was the learning curve? Because I heard that you had to work with a particularly difficult casting director. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were, uh, in fact, everything's... Where is she? <laughs> yes, uh, Every... full disclosure, the casting director is my wife, and she's somewhere <laughs> Where is uh, over she there. She cracks <laughs> a hard <laughs> whip, I mean, tell you. <laughs> Yeah, Patricia DeCerto, who's uh, David's wife, in fact, it all started here at full, uh, We had beers after the Full of Grace screening, and we were... Because that's what Catholics do. Yeah, we're having a beer, and, after and they was like, America. you know, if you, ever, if you ever do another movie, you know, you might, you might want to... My, my wife's a casting director. I was like, sure she is. <laughs> oh, yeah, I hear that all the time. <laughs> yeah, I'll take another. And then, <laughs> oh, yeah, what's your name? Uh-huh, I go home. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> all of Woody Allen's films in the last, you know, forever. Uh, so a wonderful casting director. And I think what Patricia kind of set in with us was... While she, she read a very, very early draft, so she's very generous. Um, she just encouraged us that you have something here. You really have something here. And to have someone at her caliber say, um, trust that what, because, you know, we, we're coming out of Full of Grace. It was a success. It wasn't theatrical. Um, it, was a, it had its own little life, and it does have a, a strong life on Netflix and DVD. Um, and with, as we were starting to journey with Sony, to have that kind of support alongside us to say, you know, just you can go for big talent, you can go for great actors, um, and what I, I think that's 
what, what was the real game changer for us was the, and we always were trying to keep the bar high on, on cinematography, on acting, and um, you know, this process brought us someone like James, who um, when we watched the show reel, and, because we, we struggled, you know, because either, <laughs> Yeah, well, there's some things on the show. Read. Um, <laughs> Don't look up the. Yeah, show yeah. Read. Don't look at my show. Read. Just watch Paul. No, but you you played you know everyone and it, and great popes and great villains and mm. popes that are villains and. Um, <laughs> but what was interesting, and we never would have gotten into the circle of 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 these prestige actors if it wasn't for Patricia. And we find someone because it was hard. How do you portray like Mary? How do you? We get a little bit over our heads and. We, it was finding someone who had that deep uh, inner life that was, you could believe that this guy killed somebody. Um, and, and it wasn't just, <laughs> and if you've ever had a drink with James, it's, no. You could really, and so that was important. We didn't want, a, we didn't want a light, beautiful, you know, saint on a pedestal. So we, James, Jim Caviezel, um, uh, Joanne Wally and John and Lynch, uh, and John Lynch bought the brought the ensemble that I think uh, Patricia and, and and Andrew and I were all of us were looking for. Mm -hmm. Do you want a rebuttal, James? <laughs> <laughs> I think ensemble is a really good word. <laughs> <laughs> well, also want to recognize. Uh, forgive me. Sure. I get to Malta at very short notice, very frightened by the prospect of playing Paul. Looks like a very high mountain to climb. And we did a couple of rehearsals, and then I said, could, could we have a read through? Could we have everybody in the cast? Could they be brought in from wherever they are, and just for a couple of hours tomorrow afternoon? I think it's very important to create that ensemble. Ordinarily, when you make a film, people arrive from here, there, and everywhere, and you probably don't even meet them, most of them. And I thought that we were engaged, what we were engaged upon was such an important project that we needed to engender a company spirit, if you like, and I, and I think that was important. And I think for people playing smaller roles, making, they would love to have made a larger contribution. I think it, I think, because they became part of the family, and there was no fear about that one or two days that they were going to do during the shooting period as a result. I think, I think that's reflected in the film, and it makes it easier, and the spirit in which the film was made, down to my producers, to TJ, and to Eric, and to my director. There was a spirit of such support and such love on that film that one was able genuinely to allow anything that was going to happen to you, to pass through you, to, to happen unhindered. And that, I think, shows in the film. And I thank them for the first time publicly. <laughs> well, the, uh, the film certainly and beautifully shows that the church is ultimately a community of faith. And I think that's reflective in the community that was created by the filmmakers. Um, and you answered my question, because my next question was going to be, where did you film this? So thank you for Sorry. saying it was Malta. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, I also want to also recognize that I believe you said your first AD is here with us tonight, Risto? Risto. 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 Yeah. So it did look, it looked beautiful. First time I've ever, first AD is responsible for, for discipline first. <laughs> I've never had a hug from a first AD <laughs> until Risto. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't the guy leading you around with the whip, though, no. was he? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, you know, speaking of the ensemble, uh, you know, obviously, uh, Jim Caviezel is, is very known with this type of film. Um, I guess he's really the only actor who could play one of the evangelists and still see it as slight emotion. But <laughs> yes, <that's true. laughs> um, was there any hesitancy in him sort of revisiting the Bible film genre? I mean, Jim, I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jim, Jim has uh, obviously not done anything since The Passion in this genre. And um, 
he's turned down a lot, and he, the reason he did ours, he said, was um, he just said it was the first time that he'd seen a, a real humanity um, in any of these films since The Passion. And, um, and, and he did a great job. He was, he was very um, a champion of, of really just making Luke a very human, a very real character who was struggling, who had doubts, not just this sort of, again, pious halo around his head. And, um, but he, he uh, yeah, it was the humanity in this film that really, really sparked him. And, and I don't think he ever told us he was nervous or scared or he, he went no, in fact, from, I think from day one. he wanted it to, because it was, this is, is obviously not like the passion in a lot of ways, but he, so he saw a little more freedom. And I think James and Jim together created this, you know, I, it was a delight to hear you guys laughing, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the little jokes, the write it down, the old man, that was them. That was them creating on the spot, which I thought was this really delicate way to kind of bring a little bit of levity. Mm -hmm. um, so it was something that he was, he was enjoying exactly, right. reveling in the humanity. We had those moments too, and Andrew did a great job where it was like trying to make, those, those few moments where it was Jim Caviezel playing Jesus, playing Luke. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to bring him into the, the character, you did a great job with that. Thank Absolutely. you. Well, you know, that film obviously proved that uh, a religious film could be both artful and commercially successful. Mm. And when you guys were here last time, um, I believe it was you, TJ, who used the term sacred art house. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how you see this new film still trying to uh, sort of progress with that type of an effort? Well, it's the same cinematographer um, who, I mean, had a little bit more budget, a little bit more time, and all of us with that can, uh, can become better at the craft because we just needed the time to light. So, um, again, we, we, it was building on a lot of what we, what we chipped away on, on Full of Grace. So I think the visual side of things, I think, was really important to us. And then we were just able to, again, bring the best. We were able to get a, um, Jan Kesmark to do the music. This incredible uh, costume designer from uh, Luciano uh, from, from Italy who had done another Bible movie that was more like... Uh, uh, Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat, like all, you know, bells and whistles. And what we didn't want that. Andrew's vision was always to have, I mean, and I love, you see the dirt under the fingernails. To me, it's the greatest joy. Um, <laughs> because it's, it's real, it's honest. And I, and I think um, a lot of, uh, you know, some of the great, again, some of the great pa paintings in, in, the, in the tradition, in the sacred art, have that dimension, that, that visceral dimension. So I, I think we've... Yeah. Try to progress. I mean, being uh, St. Uh, John Chrysostom has this great line where he says that Paul was confined to a narrow prison cell, but he lived in heaven. And uh, you really capture both those things in your performance, um, both that, you know, the, the physical duress that you're under, but also this, this spiritual illumination. How did you, or did you prepare particularly for, you know, the, the story of always I love with... Um, of Sir Lawrence Olivier when he was on Marathon Man, he was telling Dustin Hoffman who had to play a man who was up all night, he sat himself in a closet and stayed up all night and Lawrence Olivier said, but you know, son, that's why we call it acting. Um, Just act it, baby. There you go. <laughs> yes, no, I knew that story. Did you prepare in any particular way for being in the dark and emaciated? That would demand a diet. <laughs> it's not a word that comes readily to me. <laughs> diet. No, uh, it's simply, I, I've been an actor for a long time, a very long time. I'm in my 48th year as an actor. And I've actually been performing, really, since about the age of seven, publicly. So uh, the, uh, the conduit of imagination is accessible to me. And I simply rely on the tool of imagination, which is a very powerful tool, and I can change shape. And I well remember coming out on the Saturday, my last day of filming in Malta, and I came out onto the execution ground, prepared to meet my end, but most importantly, prepared to meet my maker, and I looked to the heavens to see the face of God. 
what I saw was the Saudi Arabian fast jet formation team flying past <laughs> because it was the Valletta Air Show. <laughs> Not a flicker. <laughs> You heard Lawrence Olivier's voice say, just act. Just act. <laughs> um, you know, coming back to a, a serious point that you raised, James, many people, when they hear Bible films, they kind of lump it with those other costume dramas that takes place in some historical past. It really has no relevancy mm -hmm. to a modern viewer. But you don't have to turn on the news or open up a newspaper to see that, um, you know, the topic, the very real topic of persecution is, is, is all too relevant. Um, you know, whether it's the persecution or the final image obviously echoes the, the refugee crisis that we're all seeing across the world. Um, beyond the dedication of the film at the end, how did those current realities inform your creative decisions throughout the film? For all my levity as an actor, and I do try and keep it light, I am deeply affected by what happens and what has been happening. And uh, I feel this is an important film. I feel it's very important to reaffirm the Christian faith at this time, to re-engender the respect for it. I'm tired of the church being denounced and other faiths being preferred and their supremacy echoed. That's why I did the film. Anyone else, any thoughts? Oh, I think it's something we're, um, we're kind of finding out more and more each day, um, as far as, you know, that wasn't the intent at the very beginning. It was really sort of when we were on set and, um, started to really consider this idea that the first century church is the exact same as it is today. And I don't know that we really think about that, especially on Sundays when we're just hearing things read to us and things that I'm not sure that we really take into consideration that Paul is speaking in this context those words. And there is a certain new impact that those have on me and a, and a new uh, profoundness to think that he wasn't just sitting in a, an ivory tower somewhere writing these beautiful you know, love letters. He was, um, he was facing what a lot of our brothers and sisters around the world face and, uh, today. And so there's something very powerful in thinking about that and remembering that, remembering that we need to, um, we need to pray for these people. We need, to be, we need to have it more on our minds, I think, is what, what came out of it, for me at least. And I think what's so ironic is that the beheadings and other atrocities are happening in the very same lands. I mean, mm -hmm. where Paul was born and where he preached is the same place that we're and hearing. And immolation. Mm -hmm. People being satellite. Yep. Still going on. <clears throat> um, in his encyclical on love, Pope Benedict wrote, being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. I think that statement not only summarizes Paul's ministry, but I think in a lot of ways it summarizes what this film is saying. Do you, do you agree with that? I, I agree with it completely. There are those who are more familiar with faith and the formal church who, who are better qualified than I to answer that. This guy. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the, it, faith is about encounter. You know, it's, it's an encounter with Christ. Um, it's an encounter with, with the living God, you know. And, and um, that was Paul's experience, you know, from, from being um, such a devout Jew and in, in learning and growing in the faith and, and so much so that, that he saw the movement of Christianity as a cult that needed to be destroyed, you know, and yet um, there was, a, there was a, a good intention, so to speak, behind it um, in the sense that he, 
it was an honest, like for him it was a, a, a passionate love for God. It was misinformed, you know, but it was a passionate love and he wanted nothing but to love God. And, and he finds out in that journey that, you know, it's, you're persecuting me. You know, you, you, this, the greatest persecutor of, of the early church and the father of persecution I had God reach down to him and, and speak to him in a way that he could hear and, and realize that, you know, it is you, Lord. Um, and just have that radical, radical change. And that, that was an encounter. It was a, it was a deep moment that led to many moments that led to him obviously being one of the greatest evangelists the church has known and one of the greatest writers the church has known. But it's more than just words on a, in a book. You know, it's, it's an infusion of the Holy Spirit laying those words down, and it's entirely about being drawn into a deep relationship with Christ. And that, um, you know, whether we're producing a short catechetical film or a documentary about someone's life or a film on Mary or a film on Paul, you know, we want people to understand that, that, that it's an encounter with Christ. And even the filmmaking process for us, I was sharing earlier with someone that I love the end result, um, be, it, I, and, and I love it for so many reasons, but I love bec be, because of, of all the things that you don't know that went on behind it to make um, what's on that screen come to, come to life. But, but the greatest thing for, for me personally is that journey that we were on with each other, you know, and seeing God become present to us through one another. And uh, that's an awesome part of the process. And, and so not only do we want that to be communicated through the stories and the messages, but in, in how we treat one another in, in our lives, too. I think it certainly is. Um, another phrase we hear a lot today is speaking truth to power. Nobody did it better than St. Paul. Um, and uh, I sometimes cringe when I hear that a film has to have a message. But I do think most films, or at least the good ones, speak a truth. What truth would you like viewers <coughs> to walk away from after experiencing this film? I think, and especially in this current, current moment, that there's one thing that is never on the lips of anybody, which is uh, mercy or forgiveness. That, that's possible. In the middle of all of the scandals and crises that we see in coming through the, every day, where if it, but there's never a possibility or a thought that um, somebody can change. So, and I think Paul, I mean, show, shows us that, uh, and it's it, it, it's not automatic. It doesn't you know happen overnight, but it's it's a it's a community thing. You need others to show maybe a different way of looking at another person. But I think that's tremendously um, important for me, for hopefully for for others. Um, okay, we're gonna two more quick questions. And I'm gonna open it up to the audience. Um, Andrew, when you were here last, you wrote me a very nice thank you note. And you gave me a wonderful quote that I've been thinking a lot about. I never had a chance to talk to you about it. I hope I remember. So, uh, well, I have it right here, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> but I'd really like to ask you, in light of this quote, your sort of overall philosophy of, of the art of filmmaking. And the quote is, the principle of art is the incarnation of God's eternal beauty. The principle of religion is the incarnation of God's eternal human heart. <coughs> Neither can do the other's work, yet their work is complementary, and I wish the divorce between them, art and religion, were more nearly healed. I wish the artist felt more of the need which art can never fill, and I wish the religious felt more of the need that art alone can fill. I wrote that? You said no, 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 I don't think so. No, I uh, obviously took that from That's why he's the writer. Someone. Foresight wrote that, but you, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you uh, said so. And you're good. Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, hopefully we, we did it again. Uh, I think that um, TJ and Eric actually got asked a very interesting question from Bishop Barron um, the other day. Uh, and I'm going to get it wrong, so tell me his question or his... Well, can, uh, what can Hollywood, what can the church do to help Hollywood? What can the church do to help Hollywood? So I feel like our attempt, we don't know how to, to get people together and to kind of take, take the reins of, you know, what Forsyth is saying, just kind of the church's responsibility of, of you know, bringing the faith. Um, but what we can do is hopefully make tools that can help, that can, um, that can draw people in, that can um, encourage people and inspire people. I think that's our job. 
as artists, um, and and just sort of the the bolstering of faith. You know, we need it. We need the church as much as anyone. You know, so I think that it is a wonderful partnership, and we're hoping what comes out of this is a clearer path forward. Because I do think that um, you know the church, the Catholic Church, has been the one of the greatest purveyors of art. Um, in the world for, for centuries. Um, the beautiful paintings and, um, you know, uh, uh, this idea that, uh, you know, this just, can we bring a little bit of that back? Um, and this is the medium of today, you know. Um, um, th these are the paintings of today. This is what we have to work with. And so can we, we can offer these tools, um, but really, um, it's up to all of you, it's up to, to the church to know how to use them and when to use them and, and why to use them. So. Um, yeah, I, I hope that we can keep a dialogue going or start a dialogue um, through this film. Yeah. I, I think it was Benedict who said the, the two best tools that the church has to evangelize are the saints that it gives birth to and the art that it creates. So um, I totally agree. Okay, last question, uh, and this is to each of you. Um, favorite moment of the film? It could either be on screen or one that happened during the filming or a favorite Pauline quote. And I'll give you a, few, I'll give you a second to think about it. I'll, I'll go first, and um, I, guess, I guess since my wife's here, I'm not gonna say, wives, be submissive to your husband. But uh, we, <laughs> we will say. Um, I, I love the, the scene, actually, at the very end, because it's something that, when I saw, I said, I wonder why no one's ever done that before. Um, the reunion between Paul and Stephen is, is really beautiful. And I think that speaks to the idea of, um, you know, that idea of mercy and forgiveness um, and, and that no life is beyond redemption. Um, so let's start with you, TJ. There's, uh, my favorite is where he tells Timothy to take a little bit of wine for the digestion. <laughs> True story. <laughs> that is scripture. You uh, that's scripture for you. Um, <laughs> Catholic reading scripture. Um, obviously, nobody reads scripture here. So, <laughs> uh, favorite moment. Um, I, I'd say there was a moment off screen that I thought was interesting. Kind of uh, one of these kind of simple, maybe means nothing now. But there was a particular moment on set, and we don't go into details with it. Was a kind of confusion and mass chaos, and we had such a tight timeline. We had you know 27 days to shoot the movie. Um, <laughs> Thank you, AD. AD. <laughs> 24 days. And so Always one of these fine. just tense, you know, you're working a six-day week, and it's just you're, you're at wit's end, and people have, are just kind of going crazy. And um, the, the, the newest woman on set who had to replace, she was an on-set costumer, um, who had to emergency replace the other on-set costumer. Uh, first day on set, bright eyes. You know, we're, you know, two, at that month, two months into this hard job, your eyes get lower. And the costume designer sent her a bouquet of flowers to thank her. And it was a, you know, one of these particularly difficult moments. And she took the flowers and, and brought it to the, um, the craft service area and just said, this is, I think this is a gift for everyone. And uh, I don't know, it just kind of harkens back to, and I think Harissa talks about it, and we talk about it here, like um, that sense of family. And if you've ever been on a film set, that's not necessarily the case. Usually, you know, you, warring camps go back to their, and that was a moment for me of like, here's somebody the, you know, who's just day one on set, but she gets it. She understood there was a spirit on set that, um, you know, and that's I don't know, how we try to. It's a wonderful moment. We try to roll. Absolutely, Eric. Well, it's tough. I want to share a, a, a quote from an actor, but I also want to. <laughs> so my favorite scene in the film, it's hands down, is 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 when when James and Olivier, when Paul and Mauritius are on the bench. Um, and, and James, uh, you know, tells the story, have you ever been sailing, you know, and compares our lives to the cup of water and the hand kind of fleeting and the, and the, the endless expanse of sea. Um, and, I, and I just love that moment. And I love when Mauritius um, Olivier, uh, you know, says, well, after all of this, what if I don't follow your, your Christ? And, and Paul's very quick to say, I wasn't trying to convince you, yeah. you know. And it, it, to me, that's such a beautiful reflection of how we should witness to God's presence in our lives, that we're, we're not necessarily there to preach at people and, and proselytize, but that we just, by, the, by, by our wisdom and by the things we've learned and our failures and <coughs> living our life and, 
and, and, and trying to be the best we can to be God's presence, I think then you see the, the experience of people being loved. I'm gonna connect that to the quote from, actually it's connected to Olivier, and, and when you think about family and community uh, um, and building that on set and, and, and what you hear is, um, Olivier had made a comment at one point. Mauritius, the guard. Yeah, he had made a comment. Um, he said, uh, this is the first time in my life that I ever thought Christians weren't full of shit. <laughs> and when I, heard that, you know, when I first heard that comment, I thought, thank you. Um, and in the sense that, um, because our heart is to just be present to people, to be real, you know, and if someone felt loved and they, and they felt uh, esteemed for the, who they were and for the valuable gift that they, they brought and, 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 you know, thank the Lord that we're able to represent Christ in a, in a, in a good way, then, you know, that quote to me is as is, is good as any quote I'll hear from Mr. Faulkner on, as Paul in the film. So, wow. <laughs> almost as good. Almost. <laughs> almost as good. <laughs> Andrew? Um, yes, very tough. Um, I mean, we had such an amazing cast and, and the crew was phenomenal. I think we had crew from over 22 or 23 countries um, that were on set. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the wonderful things there, and I won't say who does this, but there are some Christian uh, film companies that, that only work within, you know, it's very insular. You have to be a part of the church or you have to be, a, you know, a professed Christian to to work on the films, um, and that's something that these guys from day one told me, you know, that's, that's the last thing we're interested in. And so one of the, the most powerful moments for me was the scene with the Christians walking out um, to the lions. Um, so just a short anecdote of behind the scenes is, um, you know, we're all standing there, and, and behind the camera, Hristo and Matea, our cinematographer, and, and you know, probably another uh, half dozen crew, and uh, when that scene, when we started shooting that scene, it was very important to me. I put on um, actually what might be in the temp soundtrack here. Uh, we played it over the speakers so that there was just a little bit of, otherwise, you know, they're walking out, there's no sound, there's nothing. And, and just to kind of create an environment. And I look around and not one person from the crew and some of the cast is not weeping, just in tears thinking about this moment. And to have some of the crew come up who are not remotely familiar with the, <clears throat> with the story and, and say, and be very um, emotionally, uh, very, very angry and, and, and saying, did this really happen? Did this happen to people? Did this really go on? I say, yeah, you know, this, this is sort of happens and, and as you said, it's still happening. And just to kind of have that, um, ability to draw people into the gospel and into this beautiful story in that way is, um, that was very impactful. I, I, that was probably my favorite moment. I guess I've got more than one favorite moment. I think Paul's speech about love is a favorite moment. Mm. The scene with uh, Mauritius and the speech about the sea, given that Paul was very psychologically adept as a proselytizer, I think that's really lovely, and it does the trick. Paul gets his man. <laughs> but for me, the ending is rather wonderful, because that letter to Timothy is wonderful writing. And the images that, that, that Andrew chose of the Christians escaping Rome, the Last Supper between Paul and Luke. And then, as you said, of Paul encountering Stephen and those people that he persecuted in his life was for me really very moving to play that. But the best thing about that scene, no dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> I put the letter on afterwards, and you can read it. You don't have to learn it. <laughs> I love that scene. 
Well, it, it is a wonderful scene. All those moments are wonderful. Um, and uh, I guess we'll take some questions from the audience now. Uh, we should have, do we have microphones on the side? <clears throat> Got some of the water. So I ask when the, uh, hand to the microphone to ask a question. Uh, Want to raise hands, anyone? Oh, right here. There we go. Thank you so much for this beautiful film. Uh, I think it's a rich banquet of excellence, just mm. outstanding. Uh, I was curious, given the subject, I was curious why you chose not to show more miracles. I loved the, the encounter on the road to Damascus and the healing of his eyes. But what, was, what went into that decision not to show more miracles? And again, I loved the compact nature of the timeline. Just curious about the lack of miracles. I think, yeah, I think you kind of nailed it. It's just the, how, how short the timeline timeline was. And um, one thing that we're, we're kind of building to, hopefully we can continue to, to make these films and, and get, get bigger and bigger is um, we, we had a lot of discussions about how to almost, um, how to handle those things. And if you saw our Full of Grace movie, there were certain things that, that we just chose to leave out because we just didn't want to do them the wrong way, if that makes sense. We didn't, we didn't kind of want to do them in a way that felt um, cheap or, 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 and with just the, the, the ridiculous shooting schedule we had and, and that, um, there were a lot more moments that we actually would have loved. We, we had in early drafts and, and we just, the nature of it, you know, had to keep whittling down, whittling down, whittling down to what you see here. Um, so if that answers your question, it, it was more well, of a, a... I also, if I can, think that the, that Luke's, uh, Luke's choice to, um, I don't know where the guy went, um, to, to heal the daughter, you know, as you see him struggling, that that's a choice, you know, um, that, and, and I think very much in our, that's us reading it through a modern, a modern uh, eye, but what, what's going to convince you most? Uh, I mean, because he probably could have healed her, you know, uh, with, a, with God's miracle, but what an interesting drama to see a man go from the drama of choosing not to, to, and with that look, you know, that, that, that Jim has at the end of, you know, I did this through the gift God gave me as a physician. Um, so it was a, us, I think, trying to grapple and read all of the miracles, but also understand for us what would, what would convince us today, um, trying to bring it to this contemporary audience. So. And I'm glad you mentioned that, because I, what I love about that scene is so often um, in modern conversations, they position faith against science. And the fact that you have a physician who was obviously a prayerful person and he was praying for the grace to heal this person, but he used science, he used medical science to show that you know, grace builds upon nature. Uh, and and, and uh, so, so I think that was a subtle way of disabusing people of that opposition as well. Uh, do we have another question? Yes, over here. Here it comes. Um, okay, thanks. Um, thank you for this fantastic, beautiful film. Really, I think I speak for everyone around me that we're really thrilled to be part of this early screening. Um, the, I guess, observation that I had about, you know, there's been a lot of um, speculation about the life of Paul and, um, you know, the, the thorn in the flesh of Paul. Um, speculation whether it was physical or, and I just feel like watching this film, I feel like to me, and I, of course every audience member is going to imbue their own uh, interpretation, but um, I really felt like it was, um, the guilt of the um, persecution, and uh, that was what, what I took away from it, and that the um, the moment of forgiveness by Jesus and by the persecuted people was the take removal of the thorn, and it was a very uh, cathartic emotional moment for me, and I just wanted to see if you had anything to add to that, um, if, if that was part of it, or is that just all my making it up in my head? No, no, I, I think... Um I think you're absolutely right. I think um, <laughs> it's a, uh, yeah, you know, it came when I was writing the script, um, you know, I, I probably read 40, 40 some odd books on Paul and anything I could get my hands on and, and of course kind of looking at all the church tradition and things. But the one thing that came up really short to me every single time once I understood who this man was and, and what he 
what his life was and uh, was the thorn in the flesh and the sort of interpretations, the, the scholarly interpretations, if you will, on that. Um, they, felt, they felt really, really lame to me, to be honest. Um, you know, uh, that he, he was really afflicted for his life because he had a limp. Um, I mean, it's a guy that's been stoned twice, left for dead, beaten multiple times, put in prison. I don't think he would complain about a little, a little goofy walk. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, he, his eyesight was really bad, but that kind of felt, again, like, how does a man go through what he goes through and that's what he's crying out to God in the middle of the night? You know, why don't I have better eyes? You know, it just didn't. Um... So yeah, it came, it came more from a, hu a lot of prayer and then a very human, um, just thinking about the humanity and thinking about us as, as individuals and, and what we go through. That just felt like such a natural, of course that would be what he carries with him the rest of his life. I, I, you know, you can know you're forgiven and you can know you're completely loved by God, but it, 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 God doesn't erase your memories. It's not how that works. You still carry your past with you. And, and just, there was something very beautiful in that with the, you know, thinking of, of being haunted by that and for him to cling to Christ because of that. You know, your grace is sufficient to, to keep that, that away. Um, yeah, if that helps, I don't know. <clears throat> We have time for one more question. Does anybody have a question? Right here in the center. Can you get her the microphone? Can you just hold wait to get the microphone? Um, I quite enjoyed the film. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, one of the things I was just wondering was how are you going to advertise it to appeal to younger audiences? That's a very good, very good question. <laughs> <laughs> Got any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> Well, as a younger person, what would you suggest? What did you connect with? I'm not sure. Um, I think like, that it's like something, it's a little bit um, different than Do you use Thank Facebook? <laughs> Instagram. Oh, wow, you just did Instagram, well. <laughs> write that up, take a photo of us, and write that. No, but really, I'd say that, that was better than and I think any of us could have said it. And if, if like we always say, if you're moved, uh, this is not, we're not trying to sell wares here, but you know, if you're moved, you'll Show suggest it. it to a friend, or take a friend, or take your, you know, take a classmate with you and say, hey, this yeah. is something beyond maybe what you're thinking. And hopefully it's, it's um, hopefully it's, the, we wanted to really make sure there were no moments in the film that you kind of say, oh gosh, that was just like super cheese or that was not true. Hopefully it's something that uh, as a younger audience can just connect that it's, it's all authentic, hopefully. And, and you, there's never a moment where you say this feels like they're just trying to shove something at me. Um, but hopefully it, it just feels true and authentic. I, I, I never encountered anything like that um, when I was growing up, uh, you know, uh, something like this that, that just, you know, like uh, somebody was saying, you know, I love the moment where, you know, Mauritius doesn't convert in that moment. Paul delivers this amazing speech and wouldn't, wouldn't most kind of Christian films say like, and then altar call? And he's in, <laughs> but it's that's not true. That's not how that works. You know, it's that's not real. So hopefully, a younger audience can you know the the BS meter uh, hopefully doesn't go off. So we uh, we threw in some market research for you there. Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, I would be remiss. You know, there's such a lovely relationship between you and Luke, almost a father son relationship uh, in the film, and. Uh, uh, the, the man who taught me everything about film, about life, about faith, my dad is here, and um, 
you know, early on, he, many years ago, uh, he's a novelist, he had outlined a story for a film about St. Paul. So if he wrestles you on the way out for stealing his idea, I'd just ask you to indemnify the Sheen Center for that. But, Dad, thank you very much. And, you know, St. Paul says there are many gifts, but the same spirit. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you sincerely for being with us tonight and sharing your gifts. I want to thank you all for being here. The film opens up March 23rd. Go out, see it, tell friends about it. Facebook, Instagram, thank you very much.